Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the fourth episode of Brooklyn Historical Society's Bite Size History, Lunch with the BHS Collections. For five weeks, number four, every Friday at lunchtime, we're digging into one object in our collection, uncovering the many histories a single item can tell and their connections to life in Brooklyn and Long Island. Uh, I'm Nayeli Guillen. I'm a historian and project manager of BHS's Revealing Long Island History Project. Over the last two years, I've been immersing myself in historical detective work focused on some of BHS's most intriguing and mysterious objects. My work and this series would not be possible without the generous support of the Robert D.L. Gardner Foundation, um, and we're incredibly uh, grateful for their continued support. This week, we're discussing a 35-star national flag sewn in the midst of the Civil War by Brooklynite Martha J. Ovington. Like many of our most intriguing artifacts, this flag is a springboard for investigations into many topics. Um, this week, Brooklyn and the Civil War, women on the home front during the war, and surprisingly and um, sadly, even a peek into the nature of mental health in the late 1800s. For today's journey, I'm thrilled to be joined by my former BHS colleague and current curator of history, social science, and government information at the New York Public Library, Dr. Julie Golia. Hey, Julie. Hi, Nayeli. How are it's you? It's good to see your face. I'm good. How are you? I know. It's so nice to be here with you. It feels like coming home for a visit. I, I agree. I'm glad that we're keeping you for a little bit here. <laughs> um, before we dig in, just a little plug to the audience. If you've missed any of the first three episodes of Bite Size History, you can watch the recordings by going to the past events page on the BHS website. Um, and just a reminder, we want to invite anybody listening to share your questions throughout the chat. If something comes to mind, if we say something that piques your interest or prompts a question, type it into the Q&A box below. Um, don't wait until we're um, done talking. Fill it in so that way we have a nice list of these guys from you guys. Um, and we'll take as many of those questions as we can towards the end of our talk. Um, ready to get started, Joel? Let's do it. All right. Could we get the first slide, please? Not that one, though. The next one. There we go. Um, so this is that um, flag. Um, it is one of many Civil War era flags in the Brooklyn Historical Society collection. Um, it looks tiny on our screens, the sort of the digital world that we live in, but it's actually just shy of five feet by seven feet. Um, so it's definitely a flag that was meant to be seen. It was meant to be flown with the presence. Um, it's all hand-sewn wool, um, and as I mentioned, 35 stars, um, indicating that it was almost certainly created during the Civil War. Um, just for context, uh, West Virginia became the 35th state in the Union in 1863, um, and Nevada um, became the 36th in 1864. So there's a relatively narrow window of time when the national flag had 35 stars. Um, can we go to the next slide, the next view? Nayeli, while we're waiting for that slide to turn, I just want to reiterate Nayeli's point about the size of these flags. This is not the only kind of flag like this in our collection. Um, dozens of them and to, fl to sort of flag, if you will, to everybody, <laughs> how challenging these kinds of materials are to store and preserve, right? And so we've had this in our collection for a long time and it takes I would say significant space and resources for institutions, not just ours, but many institutions to manage um, textiles like this. And um, as Nayeli has often said, you know, textiles don't want to, don't want to live on. <laughs> they don't, you know, they, they, they get upset by everything, you know, to high light levels, textiles don't like, humidity textiles don't like. Um, if they're stored, you know, flags don't like to be, or textiles don't like to be folded because after a while those folds create weaknesses in the material. So you have to very carefully sort of um, roll these if you can, so that way there are no harsh, you know, edges. Um, because the longer they stay in a particular position, the more they get um, fussy and uncomfortable. Like uh, a if you will. I mean, I think it's just an <laughs> important part of the sort of the journey or the knowledge of an artifact is not just where we where it originated, but also where it's gone from there. And part of that is uh, its experiences in a repository like ours. Um, it's been really great. Over <laughs> yeah. 
We still claim you. Um, <laughs> it's been really great over the last couple of years because um, thanks to the support of the Gardner Foundation, we have been able to get a lot of these large flags, the conservation work they need. Um, and it's a little bit funny to show um, uh, you folks in the audience this one because in comparison to some of the others, it's in relatively good shape. Um, you can see here on the reverse side, um, there's a little bit of thinning, um, as particularly in the red panels, but um, maybe a couple of, of holes and that sort of thing. But for the most part, it has uh, remained intact um, relatively well. Um, one thing that's really nice about the back side here is that it does have a few ink markings, um, which combined with the family history, really um, have allowed us to identify the maker of this flag, which you don't always get. Um, if we could pop to the next slide, please. Um, the woman who donated this flag to the Long Island Historical Society, now the Brooklyn Historical Society in the 1940s, um, explained that it was her mother, Martha J. Ovington, who sewed um, the flag. Um, Martha was a born and bred Brooklynite, born in 1841, um, and was the second youngest of 10 children, so it was a big family. Um, like many of the other items that were donated by local folks um, sort of in the 19th and 20th centuries, the Ovientons were white and well off. Um, they owned a house in downtown Brooklyn, um, but they had also purchased farmland in southern Brooklyn in an area then known as New Utrecht. Um, it was actually great. We got a comment from somebody on Instagram asking if Ovington Avenue in Bay Ridge had anything to do with this family. And in fact, um, that's the same Ovingtons. That's the, their farmland um, down in southern Brooklyn that eventually sold and became um, more residential. Um, so it's their little mark on the landscape. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, Julie, as you know, this flag is just one of many items that have kind of captured my interest and obsession over the last couple of years as I've been digging into stuff. Um, but the flag is just one part of a much larger collection of materials at BHS that connect to the Civil War. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how Martha's flag fits into this larger collection and, and what as a whole we can learn about Brooklynites experiences during the war from them? Absolutely. And part of my knowledge of this collection comes from just being at Brooklyn Historical Society for a long time. I worked there for just shy of a decade, actually. Um, but a very specific exposure to it came when I worked on an exhibition that went up to um, chronicle the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. And, you know, so much was being done at that time about the Civil War. And we thought, what, what, what could our mark be? What does, what does Brooklyn Historical Society have to say about this? And one thing I think we really wanted to capture was the intimacy of war and wartime experiences, not just for people on the battlefield, but certainly for people on the home front um, in Brooklyn at the time. And how people communicated, how they made things, how they you know, conveyed their love to each other, chronicled their own history. And so to that end, our collection worked really well with this focus because it's very bespoke. Um, there's, a, there's a big focus on handmade materials, materials that were um, just sort of made and used by average Brooklynites. Um, the flag is a perfect example of it. Um, also, we have a lot of clothing and other kinds of artifacts um, that people brought with them to um, the front. Um, aspects of equipment that were used by soldiers in every day. Um, Nayeli, here on the slide, you have the, that drum, which remind us the name of the owner of the drum, because I know you did a lot of research into that. Um, the drum, blessedly, has um, penciled in names on the underside. So the, um, the New York soldier who probably carried it was named Timothy Lamoureux, um, and he was part of the German Fife Corps um, for his company. Um, and was, um, he mustered out because of a disability in 1862, so he fought for about a year um, and died maybe three years later, I think probably from complications from whatever happened to him on the battlefield, but. Yeah, and I mean, this, it's, we've been very lucky to have Nayeli being able to take these, these things as jumping off points and dig into these personal histories. And actually, Bo, if we could turn the slide. I really became enamored with these kind of small handmade materials. And these things are really small. Somebody has asked already in the <laughs> questions how big the flag was. The flag was big. It was right, it was five, about five feet wide. It was like five by three and a half or so, something like that. Five, five by seven. So five it's, seven. you know, it's definitely a, you know, a good dining room table. 
okay, the things that we're looking at right now are a remarkable contrast to this. Um, though these aren't in our collections, we borrowed them from Greenwood and I actually fell in love with these little, um, these little carved statuettes um, <laughs> that were made by a soldier who from Brooklyn named Samuel Sims, which he carved um, out of peach pits and would send home to his family. Um, so these are like maybe, one is maybe three quarters of an inch um, in diameter and the other is about an inch in diameter. And then these beautiful handmade bookmarks from our collection um, were made for a soldier named Alfred Latier and they were brought to war with him. Um, and we actually don't know how they came home because if I'm not mistaken, Alfred Latier died uh, during the war. So part of our, um, our, our interest during that exhibition, but my interest beyond that, was just to think about the intimacies of artifacts, right? And also the intimacies of the ways that people kept in touch and the way that letters themselves became artifacts. And to um, that end, I think, let's turn the slide again. So these are just, you know, this is one in a couple envelopes um, of thousands of handwritten letters um, that are in the Brooklyn Historical Society archives, which um, I and my colleagues got to read through and do a little tear shedding in the archives and beyond, um, and ultimately have to do the ultimate killing of our babies um, to pick for the exhibition. <laughs> Um, to pick, you know, like the 20 most powerful letters in our collection, which is what we featured in the exhibition that I talked about. Mm -hmm. But I think one thing that we, I, is important for people to take away, whether it comes to this flag or to letters like this, is that making things like this takes time. It takes effort. Um, writing a letter can take anywhere from a couple hours to a couple of days. Sometimes people put them away, add back, add new news, disagree with themselves in the same letter. <laughs> it's really, I think, a remarkable sort of set of exchanges that are very different in physicality, but also in sort of social and emotional structure from the way that we largely can communicate today, which is digitally, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like the opposite of a text, you know? Um, I know. I that's really notable. Absolutely. I mean, one of the um, letters that I ran across um, in researching the sort of the larger collection of flags, we have a lot of historic flags connected to the, the 173rd Regiment um, in Brooklyn. And there is a flag in one of our family collections that was written by the mother of uh, a soldier who died in action. And her name is Mary, Mary Herbert. And the letter is just devastating because, you know, written communication, having to send things by post, um, especially in the chaos of the war, her son died in July and she wasn't getting that confirmed until November. So she went months and months kind of reaching out to anyone she could find and eventually finding another um, boy from Brooklyn in the same regiment who wrote to her um, and confirmed her sort of worst nightmare that her son had died. Um, and I think that's just, just particularly devastating about like that we know the end of the story, but that the yeah. participants in the letters do not, right? Um, so right. another kind of devastating thing to read is the last soldier that a letter writes before he dies, you know? And it's like, he doesn't know, but we know. And it's, it's just a, it's a remarkably human thing that I think often gets lost, again, with letters and with things like this flag um, that gets lost in these kind of... Um, top level uh, sort of epic approaches to telling um, about events like the Civil War. You know, right. numbers like 700,000 dead um, feel, you know, become almost dehumanized. But then when you hear the story of the Herbert family, right, it's, yeah. a, it's a totally different story. Um, if we can pop to the next slide. Um, with sort of ephemeral items like this with broadsides, that, you know, these are items that weren't necessarily meant to um, last, right? They're quickly printed and, you know, we're meant to go up on a wall or wherever very quickly, but these two in particular um, are ex examples of ephemeral items that tell really um, impactful stories from uh, this time period. Yeah, I think maybe a, a great equivalent to today um, for people to think about is that um, if we were chronicling the history of Black Lives Matter right now, we might accession some of the posters that are lining that fence in front right. of the White House right now. Do you know right. what I mean? Sort of these are the, uh, in, in this case, these are printed, they're not handmade, but these are the ephemera of the time, right? Um, things that are made and are not necessarily expected to be kept forever. 
you know, this um, attention, um, merchants, bankers, and merchants, clerks, and others is a sort of a real time look at what was happening during the draft riots in 1863. Um, take immediate action in the present crisis, military now engaged with the mob, the mayor's house being sacked and torn down. I mean, this is almost like a tweet, you know? Right. Um, but I think actually the other one that you've chosen to put in here, Nayeli, this colored citizens to arms one is one of my favorite pieces in the collection because it shows the very specific way that um, black soldiers were being recruited into the war. Um, the, and um, it also speaks, as we're gonna talk to a little bit later, about um, what aspects of African-American history that we do have in our collections and which ones right. we don't. Absolutely. Um, so if we could, let's go ahead and pop to the next slide. Just to bring us back to, um, to Martha um, and to sort of life on the home front, um, what were women doing on the home front during the war? You know, what kinds of, um, as odd as it sounds to say, what kinds of opportunities um, did the war provide for, um, for American women at this period? Yeah, I mean, there's something really remarkable about the Civil War era because it creates this sort of opportunity for women with so many men on the front to take leadership roles in organizations and in philanthropy in a way, in a way that is enormously skill building and I think certainly for some very empowering. I don't want to um, overstate that and, and sort of frame the Civil War as some kind of feminist revolution um, because I think that's, that's, that's not quite accurate. It's much more complex than that. Nevertheless, in a very practical way, um, women were left not only to get involved in sort of professions and volunteer work like nursing, but also in the case of wealthier families like the Ovingtons to play a real role in philanthropy. And one of the major sort of stories of philanthropy in Civil War era Brooklyn is that of the Brooklyn and Long Island Sanitary Fair, which took place in the, in the 18, 1864, is that right? Yeah, in February, 1864. February, 1864. So sanitary fairs were these events that took place not just in Brooklyn, but across the country. Um, somebody asks, um, where was the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which was where this took place, located in 1864? And the answer is right on Montague Street, um, yeah. <laughs> about you know, a stone's throw away from Brooklyn Historical Society. Um, so these um, were to raise money for the United States Sanitary Commission, which was doing everything from providing you know, medical and hospital support on the front to providing much needed supplies um, and, and, and many other things well beyond this. To create in a multi-day event like this, women learned how to fundraise. They learned how to keep bank accounts. They learned how to communicate and talk with elected officials. Um, they, you know, arranged for vendors. I mean, they did, you know, just an enormous amount of leadership and skill building um, during events like this. And this particular one for Brooklynites felt like something very special to the women in Brooklyn. Um, they ultimately ended up raising four hundred thousand dollars during like, more like, than any other sanitary fair to that point had. I think ever, and I think maybe mm -hmm. like twice as much as the next one. Like it's a, it's a, it was a really remarkable figure for the time. It's like a couple million dollars today, mm -hmm. um, and I, I, and they actually published a little book afterwards talking uh, talking about really what I just said. I'm not. This is these are not necessarily just my. <laughs> They were like, this put Brooklyn on the map and it put Brooklyn right. women on the map. And uh, among those people would have been certainly members of the Ovington family and many other people like them. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've been frantically trying to find their, any of their names in um, mm. uh, any of that paperwork. But I, the only people I found were the Ovington brothers. So the, the two of the brothers who ran like a Chinaware shop, they donated and, and exhibited some of their um, wares during the fair. I'm glad you brought that up because in fact, <laughs> if you look at the paperwork, the leadership reads very male. So there's a way that um, it was framed as, um, you know, these men are the ones who are like ultimately financially responsible for this, but the women were doing the majority of the work. And right. I think that's a pattern that you can see mirrored in many other, not only sort of philanthropic or organizational moments, but also in activist movements in the 19th and 20th centuries. Like these men are the face of it, but women are the ones who are behind the scenes sort of running the neographs and whatnot. Yeah, I love these, um, these lithographs of the event because it just looks 
larger than life, you know. You should take with a grain of salt because they're probably. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it certainly would have been a, it looks like a colorful space to um, have spent um, a little bit of time over the course of those two weeks. I will say we have uh, photographs of them. And so people should check them out when the library reopens. I don't think they're, I don't know that they're digitized and accessible online right now, but when people I don't think come so. back to the archives, they should check out those photos. Absolutely. Um, why don't we, let's uh, pop to the next slide. Um, so with it, with a flag or with an object like this flag, um, you know, and kind of asking different questions and posing different um, kind of research questions for the item, it can take you in all sorts of different directions, right? And with this item, one thing that I found most um, startling, I, I suppose, uh, sort of unexpected was the personal story that I was able to sort of unravel around Martha. Um, you know, it, this is a national flag. It's an American flag. It's um, the sort of item that you would associate sort of most readily, most easily with um, nationalism with patriotism, particularly, um, you know, one that's associated with the Civil War. But Martha, um, you know, sort of from, you know, the moment she made this flag when she was in her early 20s, um, throughout the rest of her life really lived an incredibly um, uh, sort of tragic life. Um, and those details have just kind of unraveled via historical research. And um, what you're seeing on the screen is a page from the 1880 um, federal census. It's one of the many supplemental um, schedules that were used to, um, to put together even more information about the American public at this time. Um, and you can see Martha's name um, appears sort of halfway down Martha Ovington um, on this list of defective, dependent, and delinquent classes. So what they're pointing out is that um, for the past 18 years of her life, she had suffered from quote unquote melancholia um, and that the episode had been sort of going on for a long time, that she was seeking um, medical help um, at home so she wasn't in an asylum. But um, it's just sort of devastating because if you go back 18 years from this, from the state from 1880, it's the early 1860s, so it's around the time Martha was graduating from the Packer Collegiate Institute in Brooklyn, and it's about the same time she made this flag. So um, it's connected to it, even though it's it's a little bit um, genealogical, I suppose. Um, can we go to the next slide, Bo? Um, I hope you guys can read these a bit, but because the Ovingtons were um, a rather affluent family, um, uh, relatively prominent, Poor Martha's sort of life story um, kind of got aired um, in the Brooklyn local newspapers. The Brooklyn Daily Eagle in the 19th century was particularly fond of gossip. Um, and Martha became a kind of a subject of that. You can see um, divorce crees on the left there. Um, in 1874, Martha's father, Henry, petitioned um, for divorce for her. Um, apparently, uh, fairly soon after she completed this flag, the family sent her away um, onto Long Island to seek medical attention um, for what they claimed to be sort of um, epileptic, epileptic um, episodes. Um, and while she was at Huntington, she met a man um, and by whatever circumstance they married, the family thought that that kind of domestic um, stability might have helped with her um, illness. Um, but clearly, they were married just enough time to have a couple of children and, and by the 1870s the family decided it wasn't working so um, they divorced then made the paper and actually spread kind of around the country um, the article on the right is from Galveston Texas where she's kind of become this weird cautionary tale um, marriage as a patent medicine um, so as unlikely as it seems sort of Martha's life um, and struggles kind of give us a, a window into um, sort of women's health, women's mental health, um, and how it was treated. You know, the fact that um, the article on the left claims that Martha um, started to experience these symptoms after she graduated from Packer, um, where she had exerted herself wildly. Um, it is kind of a commentary on what that particular person thought about women's education at the time, which even that was um, relatively new. And there are so many racial and class implications in that as well, right? Yeah. It's like um, th this idea that her um, her elevated education might have been one of the reasons behind her mental illness right. is, I think, something that you would never see uttered about um, a working class white woman and right. certainly not about a, a person of color. 
um, at the time, if articles like that even would have been published, which like likely they wouldn't. This is such a fascinating story, Nayeli. And even just like, I think this, the fact that it's appearing in Galveston text, yeah. you know what I mean? Marriage as patent medicine. I mean, woo, you know, I, what a remarkable yeah. headline. But this prompts, I mean, for me as a historian, as a gender historian, as somebody who's interested in the history of public health, prompts so many questions. Um, you know, it looks like she had two children. Like what role did, might like postpartum depression have played in this? Um, yeah. If we look at the history of describing death um, and causes of death and the nature of illness, um, they're really complicated. Do you know what I mean? Like the terms are often not used in a way that is, um, what we would use today. Um, ideas about epilepsy, even it, in and of itself, were different. Certainly ideas right. about, about things like depression um, were obviously very different. And given that we're talking about the Civil War, it also prompts to me like this interesting question about men coming back from the war as well and how their mental, uh, their sort of mental impairments, things like post-traumatic stress disorder, would have been chronicled at the time. You know, we saw melancholia right. in your list, but how about mania? You know what I mean? And the other mm -hmm. descriptions that, that you saw in there that of course aren't really used today. Yeah. Um, in that time period, they just, there was no frame of reference for it. So they did the best they could and sort of, um, we know much better now, um, particularly for sort of mental disorders, how um, those manifest themselves. Um, with Martha, although her um, sort of personal story was tragic and sort of following the family forward, we can see that um, future generations of her family, particularly the women, did um, sort of come out of the Civil War period and, and really devote themselves to social reforms and change in America um, that made an impact in, in a way that Martha really wasn't able to because her life was so short. Um, can, we, can we pop to the next slide, please? I'll go through here quickly, but um, the woman that you see on the left, her name is Mary White Bovington. She was Martha's niece. Um, she was the daughter of one of her older brothers, Theodore. Um, and like her aunt, um, a local Brooklynite, she graduated from Packer, um, not with the same kind of, you know, sort of mental health implications that were uh, accused of her aunt. But Mary White Ovington today is most well known as one of the co-founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, um, the NAACP. Um, from her family, um, Mary inherited a real interest in social reform causes, particularly issues of race in America, um, and was able to really join forces with some of the civil rights leaders of the time, um, including Ida B. Wells and W.E.B. Du Bois, um, to bring this um, national organization um, to the forefront. Yeah, in a way, their lives serve as this fascinating, like almost like two option comparison, right? And so, on the one hand, you have Martha, who, you know, according to like the male overseers of her life, right. you know, was struck down by mental illness because of, you know, the exertions of intellectual life. And on the other hand, if you look into, you know, Mary White Ovington's own writing and um, her own pretty remarkable career, you see that the sort of the seeds of her thoughts and interests in this lie in her early education, and how sort of freeing and empowering could, it could be. It kind of, it brings me back to what I was saying about how this was not a feminist re revolution by any means, that this was, there, there, this was a moment in which particular kind of seeds could be planted. Mm -hmm. And I mean, of course, somebody like Mary White Ovington, like her seeds, again, had everything to do with her, her class position, um, mm -hmm. And, um, and the wealth that she had to actually support her education and to support her interests. Um, can we pop to the next slide? One member of the family that only popped into my consciousness um, after seeing the markings on this flag was Martha's sister, Irene. Um, you can see this is another little um, ink inscription on the flag, I.H. Ovington, um, who I think is actually Irene. Um, 51 Cranberry Street is where the family lived right around the time that Martha died. So I think it's possible that her sister actually inherited some of Martha's um, personal possessions. Uh, but Irene Ovington, um, like her sister, uh, well, not like her sister, she never married. Um, she stayed in Brooklyn until um, her death. She lived at the um, Hotel St. George later in life. Um, and following this kind of period of tragedy in her family, she lost um, an older brother in 1880. Martha died in 1882. Their father died in 1886. Um, Irene really devoted herself to 
um, public health um, improvements. You can see here she's named as a, um, one member of the white board of directors for the uh, Brooklyn Memorial Hospital, um, which was a hospital devoted to um, women's and children's care. She also um, published a book about home nursing. Um, so there's a I'll turn this over to you, Julie, because you can talk about the Memorial Hospital much more eloquently than me. But um, you can yeah. see how sort of Martha's legacy really influenced Irene moving forward. I think that um, I, I, I so again, I've been sort of saying when we when when VHS reopens, go check out. Um, yeah. With them is an exhibition that we have at the headquarters um, called Taking Care of Brooklyn, in which the story of the Memorial Hospital is really featured. Um, very prominently, but I actually think that VHS has published some blog posts on this topic mm -hmm. as well, and people should check that out in the meantime. So the Memorial Hospital was a story that we uncovered for that exhibition. That was a hospital that was essentially created by women um, for women and children. And this is a, a, another really kind of complicated moment for women in the 19th century as, with the emergence of medicine um, as a sort of professionalized and really branded male um, fields to go into, sort of purposefully um, alienating or you know, pushing out practices of midwifery um, that had kind of marked medical experiences, especially around women and children for most of the history before that. But women ad adopted, right? And so some women uh, turned to nursing and really branded that profession as a, as a female one. And really sort of stalwart doctors that went on and, you know, went to, of course, all women, medical school, but sort of savvily carved out a, a, a world of medicine that they framed as uniquely f female. And one of those was this organization, the Memorial Hospital. And it was not only run by women doctors and led by the first black doctor, the first black female doctor to get a medical degree in New York State. Um, a woman, a, um, Dr. Stewart, who we'll talk about in a second. Um, it also had a, a board of directors uh, that was almost all women. Mm -hmm. So again, going back to things like the sanitary fair being these professionalizing experience, these skill building experiences. By the time we move up into the 1880s and the 1890s, women are really exercising these in uh, often a really professional way. And this is a fantastic experience where the fundraising skills that would have been raised generations earlier were playing out to run a major hospital um, in Brooklyn, one, in one of the largest cities in the country. Mm -hmm. Um, so actually, if we turn the slide, um, we can talk about Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart. Um, this, you know, I, she's like one of my favorite book lines. I feel like I always, <laughs> she is just a, a fascinating woman and also comes from um, a really significant and important family um, in Brooklyn's history. Um, the Smith family, her father, Slavena Smith, um, was a pro professional and also one of the most outspoken leaders in the black abolitionist movement in the early 19th century in Brooklyn. Now we have, you know, scads of collections about the Ovingtons and families like theirs, but really minimal documentation of families like the Smith family mm -hmm. um, and countless other prominent black families of the time. This was something that was really a snag for me and my research in for the for the 2015 exhibition. It's something like 200,000 black men fought in the American Civil War, and when I went to find letters and artifacts that represented their experience, I found that we had next to nothing in our collections. Right. And then went to other institutions around the city and found that they also had nothing, and ended up finding one letter. It, like Duke University. <laughs> I mean that we had to borrow that was like a needle in a haystack. It was I was it was a blessing that I even found it. But mm -hmm. I think it really it captures the sort of idiosyncratic and you know um it for the 19th century um racist ways that most institutions collected around these topics, right? And so we have incredibly um, sort of rich collections in Civil War history and white Civil War history right. because the 19th and early 20th century people who founded this organization, that, that was history, right? right. So I think this important caveat and all that we look at and those beautiful artifacts that we looked at at the beginning is what's missing. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I, 
I'm trying to avoid going on a, um, a tangent related to something I was talking about with Confederate monuments earlier today. Very um, like, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's very true. I mean, you know, the, it's subconscious. I don't think people consciously think about it, but you know, there are certain narratives, certain stories, certain perspectives that at any one time um, are seem more naturally collectible, right? Like that's the history that um, ends up in certain institutions. And for um, an organization as old as we are at BHS, you know, we've been around since 1863. We're kind of, today fighting against um, that kind of uh, organic, you know, collecting process that brought us a lot of material, but that brought us a very specific view um, on Brooklyn's own, own past and history. Um, if we turn the slide, um, seeing this one picture sort of all by itself, Julie, it's sort of, again, kind of uh, talks to what you were saying about, you know, silences and absences in our collection. Yeah, this one young man whose name we don't know, when we set out to explore our photograph collections um, during the Civil War, a particular photographic form called carte de visite, which is sort of an inexpensive paper form of photography, um, became really popular and was sort of a perfect moment for this as people were saying goodbye to their loved ones and bringing their likeness with them. So we again have, like the letters, um, several thousand carte de visite from the Civil War era in the collections at Brooklyn Historical Society. And we looked through all of them, and this was the only black face that I found <laughs> in our entire collection. Most of them, it's listed who the people are. In this case, we, we, we do not know this, this young man's name, but I just think, yeah. that the, I think that the portrait is remarkable, and the look on this, his face is just incredibly powerful. And so mm -hmm. I always hold on to him, you know? I mean, we're lucky that we have him, yeah. um, and we have to acknowledge all of the stories and the faces that we don't have as well. Right. Well, just in the interest of time, should we turn to some of the questions, Julie, that have come yes, in? Let's do it. Definitely. And they're, I'm looking at them already. They're great. Um, thanks for the shout out to Flatbush in Maine. Um, I miss it too. <laughs> I wanted to say I'm working up some things at New York Historical Society. So um, keep an eye out for that. If you don't follow me on Twitter, I'm at Julie the PH, like Julie the Public Historian. Um, I tweet on all the things that I do. So um, please uh, check it out over there and I'll be put, we're going to be putting up some stuff um, relatively soon. Nice. Um... Let me see. So a quick and easy one. How were Mary and Martha related? So Martha's um, older brother, Theodore, was Mary's um, father. So it was, um, they were niece and aunt. Let's see. We talked about the size of the flag. So there's questions about mortality rates and Brooklyn regiments. So it's difficult to say how many Brooklyn regiments there are because the regiments weren't city specific. Um, most residents had people from lots of different cities around the, um, around the area. Um, and so I don't have an answer for that is the long and short of it because there wasn't that many people. The number I had for the number of people who fought in the Civil War, I believe it's 30,000, Nayeli. I, I think that, then. yeah. Um, it, that was also a very difficult number to track down, but it, it, I would say at least 30,000, probably somewhere between 30 and 40,000 Brooklynites fought in the Civil War. And we have um, materials sort of connected to several different um, sort of area regiments. So I mentioned the 173rd. We have a lot of material related to the 13th Regiment as well. Um, materials um, that came in largely because veterans groups um, sort of immediately following the war and into the later 1800s kind of were again aware of the sort of historic nature of, of their lives and the materials that they had and sort of popped it into our um, stewarding hands um, relatively early. So somebody has asked about what education looked like for women who are not affluent at the time. This is a great question. Um, mm -hmm. Wasn't, wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> education for most women at the yeah. time period was just kind of starting to, to sort of get its feet under itself anyway. So there was an emerging public school system in Brooklyn, which again was its own separate city at the time. It was a segregated system until the end of the 19th century. Um, the focus was very much on the education of men at the time. And I think it's also worth pointing out that for working class families, um, this is also a time when there were not, um, 
there were not really child labor laws um, right. on the books. And actually the income generated by young people, whether in a factory or whether through things like scavenging or other odd jobs, a lot of young women, for example, a lot of young Irish immigrants did domestic work, a lot of African-American women did dom domestic work, um, would certainly have trumped um, the desire to want to educate that child um, because that was the income that was keeping people you know, in their tenement apartment or with food to eat right. and so on. So um, not great <laughs> is the answer. And I think you know, it's really in the late 19th and early 20th century with the progressive era and with so um, many, again, women-focused reform movements focusing on the needs of women and children that you start to see not only the mechanisms, but also the values that women actually are worth educating, um, not just at the most wealthy level, um, right. really come into the fore and actually have a, an impact. Do you, do you know, the Memorial Hospital, I know that the hospital was sold in the early 1900s. Do you know if the building itself, it's... Is it still there? I don't, I don't, but we can easily find that out. Um, yeah. I wonder, you know, I'm trying to think about the easiest way that one would do that. Um, it, it was sold and it was sold many times over. Um, we have the address and the exhibition. I'll, um, I'll, I'll do some poking after this. And if I find something interesting, I'll, I'll hand it over to a man behind the scenes bow and we can do a follow up yeah. um, on that in some sort of social media but way. I mean the, the, the bad the bummer news about the memorial hospital is that they closed because of money right um right. The, and so they were there was a pretty bad financial depression in the 1890s they were hit very very hard by that and they eventually actually sold the building to a Jewish hospital um it was very common for there to be sort of ethnically focused hospitals um at the turn of the 20th century and um they were no more because of that Let's see. Um, let's do one last. Uh, was there a difference between how women and men with mental illnesses were treated in this time period? What do you think about that question? I think, I think that sort of the nature of mental illness as a whole was so kind of like misunderstood that I, I would assume, or I would, I would assume that anything that related to some sort of mental problem, you know, the sort of ways that that was explained away could very well be gendered differently. So, yeah. um, I think maybe the more important tension there would be about, um, class and race. Right. Um, so uh, the Ovington family had the luxury of, you know, taking their melancholia suffering um, relative and placing her within the care of a private doctor. So right. it's not available to, you know, 99.9% .9 of Americans at the time and mental illness, especially things that would have been chronicled things like mania, anything from, from, you know, bipolar to PTSD to many other things that we would think about right. today was largely criminalized. Right. And so right. there were as as asylums, um, in New York and all over the country that served essentially as prisons um, for people who suffered from mental illness. And I think particularly for people who didn't have the means to support themselves medically. Um, and so you really don't start to see major changes in that until well into the 20th century. Right. And even after you start to see the kind of medicalization um, and, and changing nature of diagnoses around mental illness, it's still highly racialized. And, um, and obviously continues to be today as so many issues related to public health are. So I think, you know, th there are lots of really interesting ways that you can think about the gendering of mental illness. But to me, for the purposes of, you know, thinking about experiences across time, I think that those class and race differences are in some ways more important. Yeah. Um, I mean, asylums also, the sort of the reform of uh, the asylum movement in the late 19th century was also a sort of female driven right. um, uh, reform movement because there was an awareness of that kind of confluence of, of disease and, and a sort of the criminal element um, and how people were being treated within those state sponsored or otherwise asylums became a big um, sort of target of, of um, public outcry. That's um, right. And actually like uh, was part of early muckraking journalism. One of the most famous um, sort of, they were, they called them stunt girl reporters of the 19th century. <laughs> so 
a young woman named Nellie Bly who mm -hmm. um, basically posed as an insane poor woman um, and chronicled her time on Blackwell's Island. Um, and, um, and it was really, a, it was, it blew open the, the nature of treatment there um, because it really was a kind of shut the door and throw away the key kind of right. approach. Um, but you know, this is a fascinating topic to study. And I think a great example of the way that the past can really um, shed a lot of light on the way that continued stigma around illness and mental illness continues today and beyond. Absolutely. That's quite the note to end on, but in the interest of time and since um, I forgot to eat my snacks and now I'm hungry, um, why don't we go ahead and wrap up um, this episode of Bite Size History. Um, thank you so much, Julie. Is, the nice thing is we're not saying goodbye because we're going to see each other next week, right? That's right. <laughs> Julie is coming back with us next week to discuss our final item um, in the Bite Size History kind of Rolodex. It is an, a 1643 land deed um, granted to the first known person of Muslim origin in the Americas whose name was Anthony Van Soleil, um, or Sally. Um, You're right. Um, Julie was the brainchild behind um, bringing this particular artifact into the BHS collection. So um, we're going to have a great conversation around it and all of the, um, again, sort of silences in history that it, it um, blows open for us. Um, one last time, we'll just give a quick shout out to the Gardner Foundation for the continued support of the Revealing Long Island History Project. Um, as always, everyone stay safe, have a relaxing weekend, and we will see you back here um, next Friday. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Nayeli. <laughs>